uh, start the Plaxico River Regional School District Committee meeting for January 22nd, 2015. Please rise. Introduction to members. I'm Steve T from Melville. I'm Jane R from Melville. Whitney Green Stein, Blackstone. Aaron Vinaco, Millville. Dave Thompson, Assistant Superintendent. Alan Hillberger, Superintendent. Bill Chaplin, Blackstone. So we're going to jump around our agenda here a little bit. Uh, we're going to hold off on the public forum and the report of the student representatives to get right to the most important part of the meeting, where we have Mrs. Warren's fourth grade class, that we are very, very, very excited for you guys to be here and to uh, report to us on uh, all the great things you're doing. So turn it over to you. Don't be nervous. Start with a joke. We can do a knock-knock joke, whatever you want to do. You, you might not hear it, but they'll hear it. Yeah. Part of the fourth grade curriculum is to study animals and how they meet their basic needs in their environment. These basic needs are the right climate, oxygen, water, shelter, and food. If an animal cannot meet these basic needs in its environment, the animal must adapt. If the animal cannot adapt, it might slowly decline in population. This might lead to the animal being placed on an endangered species list. We will share some of the topics and books we heard about these animals. Process. We used a variety of resources to help us understand our animal. We used our computer lab on a weekly basis. We also used the iPad cart, which contains 20 iPads. This allowed us to research important facts on animals. Thank you for allowing us to share our learning with you. Knowing their names, so when they come up, Lucy, they, Lucy. I know, I know, we see them. No, you're fine. I'm Claudia Bland, and I did the Australian Ginkgo. Australia's prowling predator is either a vicious wild dog that attacks children and devours farm animals, or a loving and devoted pet as cuddly as a kitten. It just depends on him. Australian Dingo, common name, scientific name, Canis Lupus Dingo, classification, mammal, part of the canine family or wild dog. Australian Dingo. 
dingo behavior. The dingo can be a social animal living in a pack or alone. Living in a pack is a learned behavior. They have also learned to play possum when they feel threatened in the wild. In the, in the wild, they also learn to howl with each other and to communicate. They, the way they, it will hunt for its food is an instinct. It can adjust its hunting style to the size and availability of its prey. The dingo can also climb a tree by jumping into the branches. The dingo is nocturnal in warmer regions, but less. But they are less so in cooler areas. The dingo will be, usually stay in one territory to hunt until the food supply is gone. They will mark their territory to set boundaries. Because the dingo can adjust it to most climates, it doesn't need to hibernate. The dingo doesn't migrate with the change of seasons, but they will when, when there is a food, so, food shortage. Why the dingo is endangered? The Australian dingo is becoming endangered. If we do not step up soon, they will become extinct. The Australian government allows farmers to kill the dingo with poison or traps. The biggest reason they are becoming endangered is because they are breeding with domesticated dogs. It is becoming hard to tell the dingo from a crossbreed. It is also a problem because people are hunting them. People will hunt the dingo for its scalp and its skin. Some people even hunt them to breed and breed them and sell. The sad part is the Australian government has no laws in place to protect the dingo. They play an important role in the Australian ecosystem. There are also dingo conservation parks in Australia. That is the only place the government will protect them. Australian dingo interesting facts. Australian dingoes do not bark the they howl. There are three types of howls, moans, howls, and snuffs. Dingoes' paws are like wrists that you can use to turn doorknobs. There have only been three attacks on humans by the dingo in over 200 years, and about 14,000 reports of attacks from domesticated dogs on humans in one year. I'm Sophia Mazzucchelli and I did the tree kangaroo. Oh. Did you draw them? Yes. Name of animal, golden mantle tree kangaroo. Common name, tree kangaroo. Scientific name, Dendroglyphus. Classification, mammal. Diet. Tree kangaroos mostly eat leaves, flowers, fruits, and nuts. They also eat bird grains, eggs, and tree bark. Some trees that they eat are elder, ficus, elm, willow, and maple. They are also known to eat bamboo. Why endangered? Tree kangaroos are endangered because of hunting and loss of their habitat. Hunters will hunt them for fur and for their food. If food. Their habitats are being destroyed. This leaves the tree kangaroos prey to wild dogs, snakes, and crocodiles. Interesting facts. The, the tree kangaroo's length of its tail is the same length of its body. Tree kangaroos have very short teeth that are sharp so that they can tear off leaves with trees. The name is Ray Haggerty, and I get the koala bear. Common name, koala. Scientific name, Fascularta sunieris. Behavior. Koalas are lazy animals. They are slow moving and have low energy. Koalas are nocturnal and sleep up to 16 hours a day. Koalas are also completely harmless and they love to sit on human arms. They spend most of their time sleeping and caring for jokes. Why endangered? One of the reasons koalas are endangered is because of diseases. They suffer from eye infections and bone diseases. Another reason is, is that humans are destroying their habitat so they can't find a place to live and getting too stressed. Interesting facts. Koalas are marsupials. When koalas are, bar are born, they're not fully developed. I'm not a 
Jason got that and I did the snow leopard. Scientific name Panthera uncia. Common name snow leopard. Classification mammal. Habitat. Snow leopards are found at high altitude in the steep and rocky mountains of, cent of Central Asia. China contains 60% of the snow leopard's habitat. The climate there is cold and dry. Only grasses and small shrubs can grow there. Snow leopards prefer rough land with cliffs, rocky ledges, and ravines. These landforms provide good cover and clear views to help the snow leopard sneak and find up on their sneak find and sneak up on their prey. Snow leopards are nomadic, which means they are constantly moving around. They travel along ridge lines and cliff bases and then choose bedding sites with good views of the surrounding land. Snow leopards can travel up to 27 miles of open land in one night. Endangered. Snow leopards are endangered mainly because of human activities. One of the reasons is poaching. Hunters will use snow snow leopard fur for garments. Their bones are used in traditional Asian medicine and are sometimes captured for private animal collections. The second reason is retribution killings. Snow leopards sometimes eat farm animals when their usual prey is not around. Then the herder kills snow leopards to protect his flock. The next reason is loss of habitat and prey. Snow leopards are invading the s people are invading the snow leopards land and are also hunting the prey of snow leopards. Another reason is mining. Mining uses dangerous chemicals and explosives. This causes snow leopards to relocate because of ecological damage. The last reason is that enforcing laws to protect snow leopards are, are expensive and it's very hard to catch poachers. Interesting facts. There are only two known attacks on humans ever recorded. The first was a rabid snow leopard that injured two men. The second attack was a starving snow leopard that attacked a man, but the snow leopard would capture it instead. Snow leopards are incredible jumpers. They can jump as far as 50 feet. There are only around 6,000 snow leopards left in the, in the wild and around 600 living in zoos. My name is Declan Shave and I did the Tasmanian Devil. Classification Tasmanian Devil, Tasmanian Devil, Circophilius harassi, Mammal. Habitat Tasmanian Devils live off the southern coast of eastern Australia on the island of Tasmania. Habitats include forests, meadows, seashores, and around human settlements, but it's usually found in a brushy or wooded area. Why endangered? The Tasmanian Devil is endangered for many reasons. The main reason is because savage fights that often break out and lead to death. Other reasons are diseases spread by one Tasmanian devil fighting another devil. In addition, the food supply had been running out. In the old, in the old days, overhunting was a big reason the Tasmanian devil was going extinct. Fun facts. When the devil has a baby in his pouch and the mother goes swimming, close up the pouch so the babies don't drown. The Tasmanian devil partially spins around by switching from a side view to a front view. They go so fast it looks like they are spinning. Hi, my name is, my name is Brooke Chow and I get the chinchilla. Common name, chinchilla. Scientific name, chinchilla langria. Classification, mammal. In the wild, chinchillas live in social groups called herds, which contain around 100 individuals. Chinchillas are primarily nocturnal animals, with active peeking at dusk and dawn. During the day, they rest in holes among crevices, emerging at dusk to the forage through the night. Chinchillas make a variety of vocalizations, including chirps, squeaks, and barks. They use these sounds to express themselves from a calm, loving chirp given to a potential mate to a loud, aggressive bark when threatened. Chinchillas are very clean creatures. Predators of the chinchilla in the wild include birds of prey, skunks, felines, snakes, and canines. Chinchillas have a variety of defense tactics, including spraying urine and releasing fur if bitten. Why endangered? Chinchillas are endangered due to ex 
exploitation of the animal for fur. Protected wildlife populations continue to, to decline. Its habitat is threatened by human land alterations in North Center Chile. Without funds, researchers and conservation wildlife populations will be extinct in the near future. Chinchillas are originally gray in color with a small squirrel-like body and large mouse ears and a bushy tail. The characteristics that they are best known for is their plush fur. <coughs> Where humans have one hair from a single follicle, a chinchilla has more than 50 hairs from a single follicle. An adult chinchilla weighs 500 and 800 grams. Interesting facts. Chinchilla. Chinchillas can swim because they can float from all their fur. Chinchillas can go without water for three days and without food for two days. Hi, my name is Brock. I did this song. The common name for the sala is sala. The sala is a large wild ox. The, the name rhymes with Nauha. Its classification is map. Habitat. The sala lives in the forest is along the mountain range between Vietnam and Loa People's Democratic Republic. Most live south of the Song Cao River in Vietnam. The total range of they that they live in is about 2,500 square miles. Behavior. The Salva has not been studied in the wild yet because they are so hard to find. Most of the information scientists have about them comes from the observing a captured female Salva in the zoo. So, Salva give birth in, at the end of the dry season between April and June. The Salva is more active in the morning in the mornings and afternoons. It can use a large scent gland on its head to mark its territory. It lives alone or in pairs in the wild. Usually, the pair is a mother and her offspring. The sallow can use its horns as weapons when it's in danger. It cleans itself with its long tongue. The only recorded noise of the sallow is a shh, is a short, short. is known as an Asian unicorn because it's rarely seen and some people think it's imaginary. The Sala's horns are collected as trophies and other parts of its body is used for medicine. Hi, my name is Abigail Farino and I did the L Sala. The elf owl has two common names. One is the dwarf owl and the other is the Whitney's owl. The scientific name is, is the Mergrathian Whitney. The classification is a bird. Elf owls live in North America. They nest in cactuses. Also, they nest in tree holes made by the woodpecker. They're mostly in reptilian habitats where there's water. They live mainly in the southwest of the United States and Mexico. Baby elf owls have fluffy gray feathers. They weigh less than one ounce. At birth, the elf owl is as small as a human thumb fingernail. Young elf owls have grayish brown feathers. Adult elf owls are five inches tall with a wingspan of 15 inches. They weigh one to two ounces. Elf owls don't have ear tufts. They have white feathers around their eyes that make it look like eyebrows. Interesting facts. Elf owls nest in holes made by the woodpecker, and elf owls are the smallest owl in the world. The elf owl is Watson, who went first. I thought we'd wait until the end to clap. We didn't give her a run. Great job.
So hold on, we're gonna come to you and shake your hands and look at what you got there, and we'll take like a two or three minute break. Mm -hmm. So stay where. Right. What we should have done was had you come up here. Mm -hmm. We should have sat down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next time you come, we're gonna do that. Okay? But we're gonna come to you now and look at look at your books and, and go from there. Okay? Stay right there.
Volunteers, but you know what? If they volunteer, I think it's great that they have the opportunity. Who was a volunteer? I said if they were volunteers, it's good to have a big group. If they want to volunteer, have them all. We'll just do the walk around, check it out. Don't come to my neighborhood because my two boys are running around with children. Really? were represented. So both did this science curriculum. We'll talk about that later. Mrs. Warren, thank you again, Mrs. Warren. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. Wonderful. Forward. This is start our meetings like that every time. Agree. I was telling Mrs. Warren over there, no matter how high a pile is, we always we should always start with this our pile. Um, okay. So we're going to go back into order, public forum. Seeing nobody, we'll move to student presentation. Mrs. Watson, you have nothing. No questions. Okay. <laughs> we have a second one. <laughs> So um, it's kind of been, again, a slow couple of weeks, uh, but a lot of little things here and there. Uh, I'm going to start off with the student council. Um, so coming off the pep rally and everything and powder puff the month before that, we are kind of taking it slow as a student council. Um, between the council and National Honor Society, we're doing our Super Bowl, Super Bowl event right now. And um, basically, we're collecting cans of soup at all lunches, and we're kind of making it into a little bit of a competition between the classes and the staff. So each class is going to have their designated spot in the lunchroom. They can kind of castle up their cans, and um, anybody who brings in a can 
gets entered into a ten dollar uh, Dunkin' Donuts gift card raffle, and that's to each grade. And then uh, not for the staff, unfortunately. But. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're really looking forward to that. That goes on until the 11th. It started the 21st, so that was yesterday, into the 11th of February. And then um, last night we actually had um, what we like to call a student council council bonding activity. Um, so instead of having our serious night meetings, we kind of ran one of our mock conferences. So uh, some of the officers, myself, Griffin, and a few others, ran uh, kind of like little workshop style things. And uh, that was really fun. We bonded as a council, got closer, got to know somebody maybe we didn't know. And then um, that also helps us towards being ranked on a state level as a student council, which actually is coming up in March. It's a little bit later. It's early to mid-March this year. Uh, it's our annual trip to Hyannis, and it's a three-day conference at the resort center down there, and that's really fun. We're sending 12 representatives, I believe, this year. I think we're going to do eight girls and four boys. Uh, that's really fun. We've done it in years past, and it's great leadership training and stuff like that. And then... Moving on, we have midterms next week. Um, looking forward to that. Luckily, they don't start on Monday, so uh, that was nice. Thank you to whoever decided that. Gave us that day off the weekend. Um, but Tuesday, we have our A period and our B period. Wednesday, C, D. Thursday, E, F. And Friday, only one exam, G period. And um, we can actually leave after our midterm exams if our, student, if our parents write us a note saying we can be dismissed after the exams. So that is all I have. Some news in sports. Um, probably most important is all the baseball team is actually getting funded a new backstop. That's the fence that goes around the baseball field. But our old one was very far back and more complete by the ineffective and such. We have a magnificent that's being put up. It's absolutely beautiful. It's a painted black. It's at least seven feet taller than the old one. It has a curved arc on top of it, which the old one lacked. It's closer and more appropriate for the baseball diamond. And I know the baseball team is very, very excited about that. It's a huge thing. As far as actual winter sports, uh, we actually got the names of all members of the teams being on the cafeteria walls, on the windows. So that's a really good like, team spirit thing because everyone at lunch is can see everyone who's getting involved. Uh, our schools and girls track team is going to their final meets. We have a few big competitions coming up as far as championships uh, culminating in states and districts. Um, other teams are continuing. The basketball team has had quite a few games lately. Uh, the season will start to wrap up soon, but there's still quite a bit of time left. And the football team has already started training, either on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, which is good. We're looking for a promising season in the fall. In the National Honor Society, um, the Empty Bowl Dinner, which is actually going to be on the last day of the Super Bowl fundraising event, that will be held February 11th. Uh, tickets will be sold for that by NHS students. If you have any questions, contact a member of the National Honor Society or Mrs. McLean at the high school. And that's a dinner in which you pay $7 for a ticket, and you get two bowls. I mean, not two bowls, sorry, two tickets to fill a bowl with soup. But you can actually get a bowl that a student made in a pottery class. There's a raffle for that, too. There will also be a 50-50 raffle for that day. And, of course, the uh, cans and money raised will be going to the food pantry. As far as um, the bands, uh, the jazz band is also going to be performing at the Empty Bowl night, uh, February 11th, so that's very exciting. Um, the night after, they will be performing at the Glorious Stadium Theater on February 12th. That's always a great performance. There will be people from uh, Mount St. Charles, their jazz band, the One Socket Jazz Band, and North Smithfield Jazz Band. We all go together and play the show. It's always very fun. Winter Percussion will have their first shows the weekends before and after February vacation. The times will be announced, but the first one is the Dartmouth Show in Dartmouth, Massachusetts, the second being the home show at Blackstone Millville. Winter Guard will have that home show in conjunction with Winter Percussion. They also have had a few shows coming up. Woodland and Brass Choirs perform at school events, and they've been practicing very good. The second semester is starting soon. 
and that means students who took semester classes will change to their other semester classes. Students taking a virtual high school class, uh, some took them first semester, others six months of some second semester. And one really exciting thing that's been continuing throughout the last month or two is we have a bulletin board hanging in the main lobby of our high school, and students in the senior class who get into a college actually have their name and their college they got into printed on it, and those are all being hung up as graduation caps in the main hall. And that's really exciting because the, uh, the board just gets more and more filled as you see more and more students get accepted to all these main schools. It's just a really nice way to show the accomplishments of the students and the futures that lay ahead. Questions? Come on, the committee. Anybody needs any empty bowl tickets? I still have a few. See you, Eric. Great, great job, guys, as usual. Um, uh, how many days left? Is that Be ready next time. Have that number ready. Yeah, they got it here. Yeah, I'm sure they're still counting down. <laughs> Moving forward, consent agenda A, warrants minutes of the meeting, January 8th, 2014. Those warrants is field trips on here, the use of facilities. So, use of facilities is the dance company. I just wanted to let the committee know that this is a, um, we typically have a fee associated with it, but it is a fundraiser for one of our neediest students. And um, so I would recommend that we waive the fee. Okay. All proceeds go to the Okay, questions? I'd like a motion to uh, approve uh, consent agenda A. Any further discussion? All in favor, sorry, say aye. 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 Unanimous. Uh, and we will move to the school committee. Um, the budget survey uh, results um, have been posted in this packet. Uh, so it will be online if people want to see the uh, questions and the results and the comments in totality. Um, like I said last time, a third uh, was... Um, I would say negative. The third was positive, and uh, the middle was kind of middle ground neutral. Um, I, I will highlight some of the um, things that we're working on from that feedback in terms of um, more layman's terms, uh, in terms of you know information out earlier. Um, so uh, next month during our public forum, uh, we're going to have uh, packets ready, uh, and then we're also going to put those, make those available at the library and the senior center. Um, and anywhere else that would be doable. Um, but um, I sent the copy to the committee, look at it. Uh, we can look at it and talk about it at our next meeting as well. <coughs> um, so that is the budget service. So it's closed now. Uh, we got a, it was it was, was good feedback uh, mm -hmm. overall. Um, the foundation formula open meeting um, is this Saturday for the central um, mass area. It's at Neshoba Regional High School in Bolton. Um, I think it starts at 11. Uh, I'll definitely be attending. Uh, I've been getting the notes. I think I gave you the notes from the previous ones. Good information. Probably to be a lot of sim similarities in terms of the feedback they, that they get. Um, so hopefully there's some um, some little bit of change that comes along with that for FY17. Uh, and then the MASC training trainings uh, are listed. Um, I think I sent. Uh, I know Jane and Georgetta are going to go to the charting the course. March um, at uh, King Philip, they're offering it at. Uh, and the other one I wanted to point out was uh, the yes. MASC Day on the Hill in April. It's April 29th, uh, 8.30 in the morning. This was, I went to this event last year. It was really a good event to uh, watch the uh, legislative process. Uh, is a good event? legislative process uh, in terms of how they problem solve. Um, what I am going to kind of put out there to you, um, Mr. Hilberger, is there might be some high school students that want to go. So um, maybe you could look into that and we would clearly get them there. Maybe they have 
devices and whatnot. So I know last year there was some school committees there that had students with them. Uh, and it was it was a good process. Um, so it would be good if, if, if several of us went. Um, so it's April 29th uh, at 8.30. And you do really get to sit down and advocate uh, or uh, spend some time with the local legislators. So it'll be interesting this year with all the changeover. Um, we're really not going to have, now we'll talk about this, we're really not going to have any inkling from um, Governor Baker until probably March 4th uh, in terms of what the money is going to look like. So that's after our public hearing. We're going we're gonna to do our best in terms of um, estimating what we think uh, we're going to get in terms of the uh, students. But uh, those are the upcoming ones. And um, uh, I am also going to go and have someone come here to go over superintendent evaluation, as well as, um, and I'm open for discussion about this, uh, they'll do a, uh, we, they can do it the same day, uh, but also assessing how we function, mm -hmm. uh, self assessment They have one out, they have one yeah. that we can actually fill yeah. out and go through the whole process yeah. of filling out on, I, I think that would be important. Yeah, I think it's a good thing. It's good mm -hmm. that they have at least a good thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> um, so I think those are things that are on the on the horizon that we'll kind of we'll continue to uh, get facilitated. So, um, all right. So that's it for the, any other items. Um, well, the regional the regional agreement survey closed at the same time that the budget okay. survey closed. Um, I haven't had a chance to analyze the results, but I can say um, just in terms of bar graphs, um, how happy are you with the current division of the elementary schools? 22% roughly said unhappy with the division, 14 very happy, 17 happy with the division. So, um, And then you have 37% that was kind of right in the middle. Um, and again, this will all be available as well. Yeah, you said it's more make it available. Right. I did export it. I just had it together with the other surveys that um, are um, done. Um, do you feel that the elementary schools are functioning to support the learning of all children? 48% um, said yes, 51% said no. So, um, do you believe that the classroom space and all the schools are being utilized? And 63% said no. Um, if you had your child transition from elementary school to middle school, how easy was the transition for your child? And it was right in the middle, okay, which coincides with the survey that we sent out to the teachers and the students. So um, that was consistent. Um, and if you sent your child outside the district, what were the main factors that influenced your decision? Um, and stronger academics, specific programs, or NA was were the highest of the of the bar graphs. But again, um, there are many responses on there that we have to go through and um, bring it all together. But that's just a snippet of what the results are. Right. I, mean, it's, it's, I, think that I, th I would rate these both a successful mm -hmm. survey. Mm -hmm. the it's good numbers. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and a good response back. And so. it was a variety from both yeah. Blackstone and Millville. Yep. So I think it's important to know that both Blackstone and Millville shared in yep. the response. Yeah. And I think, again, uh, everything that's in this packet is made is public. Uh, on our website, um, uh, on the district page, on the school committee, um, under the uh, agenda, and so forth. So everything that we're looking at, you can go and look at as well. Um, and the surveys will be up there. So um, uh, we and, encourage you to look at them. And just to reiterate, just because I read some of the responses on the budget and um, also the uh, regional agreement, that it's important to know that paper copies are available. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'm just not sure if there's a way we can do it on the Blackstone, you know, the, the Blackstone channel that we can say the following things are available, you know, yeah. because yeah. I think oftentimes it's it's said, but unless you're watching, I don't think they under, they know. So I think if we had a place where it's always up and you're scanning the TV and you say, oh, it's available, they might, you know, we might get more people to go down and actually go through the budget and actually be aware of the things that we're talking about. Yeah. And again, our, you know, we have a 50% of responsibility in the relationship. Mm -hmm. The public has the other 50%. So I think making them available and the, and the feedback around having card copies available, it will absolutely be available from February up until the town meeting. Um, and when changes are made, we'll, we'll put that over as well. So that's important. Okay. Moving forward, anything else? Okay. Report of the superintendent. Thank you very much, Mr. Chaplin. Um, I just wanted to jump down first to a couple of the other questions.
discussing budget. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to announce that uh, we extended our high school principal's contract. Mr. Michael Dudek is, is completing his third year already under uh, the third different superintendent. And um, he is uh, really uh, an interesting educator because he is so thoughtful in his analysis. And uh, he's doing a wonderful job. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to say that we have Mr. Dudek under contract for three more years, starting July 1st. Great. Um, there are many openings for high school principals throughout the state, and um, they're not always easy to fill, so we want to make sure we let him know that we care that he stays with us, and so um, we're, we're happy to announce that. Um, a quick update on the roof project, certainly um, the complex is now in final audit of the roofs that we completed last year at AFM and JFK, and as soon as we get that approved, we will post the uh, final numbers um, for the committee as well as on the website. The high school is really completing a punch list of a few more items, uh, primarily around custom-made um, fittings and finishes for some door frames and ladders. So we're waiting on those uh, to be finally installed, and then that project closes out. But they are complete. Otherwise, the, um, unfortunately, um, they all couldn't go perfect. Wilville Elementary uh, ran into some issues <laughs> that, um, due to improper installation of some of the masonry. And um, the principals involved on the team have agreed that they, through a series of events, poor communication, um, lack of oversight, um, need to fix it. And so that is taking place now, we have to reorder some more brick. Um, a different uh, group of eyes will be on what the work, the work that was already done, and um, they're going to have to redo it at no cost to the project. So that is on the, the project manager, the architect, the um, general contractor, and the subcontractor for the masonry. Uh, all will be making the proper adjustments and fixes uh, so that project finishes 100%. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to take another uh, bunch of warm weather for them to remix the mason with the, uh, the mortar and put the uh, building back together the way it should have been done the first time. But uh, the good news is no additional cost. MSBA, which is the school building authority, which uh, has uh, contributed 57% of that project, understands the delay and um, continues to fund their share. So that's a good thing. The oversight does pay off, but it was a bit frustrating um, as, as we recognized what was slipping, but the professionals did come back and you know, we'll make it. Um, and your question, correct. This is, yeah, I'm learning more about Mason construction than I ever wanted to know, but when the, the wall meets the extended roofs, you have a uh, stepped through wall flashing, which will help to make the building actually drain properly. And there are ruby poles, there are um, CMUs behind there, there is drip edges, there's dams behind that all work together in sequence to keep the building um, dry. And uh, it's it's complicated for a layman, but for the professionals, it's, it's pretty straightforward work. Um, or so it was explained so that's the pieces. There's all about four different locations where they're going to have to go back in and probably pull out the work that was done. Hence, they have to order more brick, which will be the perfect timing. By the time the brick gets here, the weather's warm enough, they finish the job the right way. I just I heard you on the Slugman's meeting the other night, and uh, what did you do? It says that the water test, I wondered what spot it was. Right. So it was more. <laughs> is, there, is there potential for damage? With winter storms? No, the building is now weathertight and buttoned up um, so that uh, we, we survive the winter. If it happens, I guess there's a little bit of snow coming. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. On a Saturday. Yeah, so um, it, it was frustrating, but it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's a fairly routine 
piece of work around the through wall flashing that protects where the brick intersects with the wall of the shingles. And that's what um, needs to be redone um, to everyone's satisfaction before the project closes out. We do, we are holding plenty of money and uh, are not paying anything further out until uh, we get to um, commissioning by an independent uh, third party that MSBA requires. So that's the, uh, the update. And probably not until April will we have the final um, disposition on that. Um, for the for the this evening's portion of discussion of the FY16 budget, um, it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to the committee and to folks at home our new uh, technology guru. And um, I, I don't believe that begins to describe all of his talents, uh, Mr. Osiris Gonzalez. Uh, he comes to us from Newport, Rhode Island, which, uh, interestingly enough, is another one of the park states, the Partnership for the Assessment of Readiness for College and Career Testing um, that is being done in, in several states. And so because of the fact that he has already uh, engaged with his prior district to get that district ready for all of the technical requirements around the PART test, which is a computer-based test. Um, we feel very fortunate that uh, we have him on our team now. And, uh, Dr. Thompson does tease me a bit about being old and less technologically savvy than he is. Um, I let him believe that because it's a good strategy. Um, it's true. And, um, and Osiris, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, is certainly welcome addition to our team, and uh, you get to hear uh, his assessment. Uh, again, it's only been a few weeks that Mr. Gonzalez has been so it's a uh, good friend of mine. It looks like he has so far, so welcome to Osaka Gonzalez, and I uh, look forward to uh, as everyone knows, Dr. Thompson has been working extensively uh, assessing our curriculum needs and getting us all realigned with all of the state initiatives that we were a bit behind on. Um, so it's been a busy year for that. Um, it's included as part of our district improvement plan. And the intersection of curriculum and technology and professional development is very, very challenging because they all go hand in hand, but they require very specific timing and, and very specific allocation of resources to make it all fit together to drive the best teaching, to give us the best learning which will give us the best and most outstanding achievement. So, uh, welcome to you both. Thank you. Good to be here. I've been in this seat for a while, but that's okay. <laughs> um, real quick, I just want to start off, just kind of take a step uh, aside, aside. I just want to go back and revisit uh, last Friday's Professional Development Day. Uh, as I explained to you before, uh, we had basically kind of two halves of the day. One was uh, some extensive training on the educator's evaluation system. Uh, I can report that that went excessively well. Um, the uh, trainer, David Castellan, was absolutely tremendous. I think that he uh, managed to get everybody, teachers, administrators, all on the same page with a common understanding. Uh, and we're looking to possibly bring him back uh, early next year, uh, finish our, uh, our, our negotiations, uh, get some feedback on what he's need to spend more time on, but keep working that. It is a very important part of our process moving forward, looking at student work, looking at professional development, looking at developing teachers, and building that collaborative environment in our schools. I think he put us on the right path. The other uh, half of the day was spent in one of three areas, um, working on the curriculum mapping project, which has been going very well. Uh, we're in a really good place at this point. There's always a couple exceptions and a few difficulties, depending on the last time when we looked at the curriculum. But most of the curriculums are sketched out at this point, and we're looking to start moving them into the Edwin Teaching and Learning Platform. Uh, the other piece that did happen was we completed the DDMs, uh, and teachers are now in the process, if they have not already started, of piloting those, collecting data, and we will look at scoring them later on this spring. Just one question. Can yeah. you just explain to the viewers at home what DDMs are? 
EDMs are district-determined measures. This is part of the evaluation process where we are measuring student growth. Uh, if you're in math or English, you have to use the NCAS as one of those measures, and you have to develop your own measure. And you're looking for student growth and how much growth. You're looking for a normal piece of growth. So you're looking for a year's worth of growth roundabouts. Um, and we use multiple measures depending on the subject area. Phys Ed, for instance, will have two of those. If you teach uh, English, you would have one you develop plus use MCAS to get an overall score for um, student growth. And if you have good growth and uh, a good evaluation from your evaluator, uh, you're on a tenure professional status, you're on a two year uh, growth plan. It's a little complex. If anyone really wants to spend a lot of time on it, uh, they should probably uh, give me a Call, but, that, but the student growth is part of the evaluation system, and that affects uh, the, the, the growth plan for educators and the goals for educators. So that's what that's about. Well, uh, the other piece uh, that happened, and this was obviously at the high school, is developing uh, their MCAS, uh, sorry, their NEASC uh, reports, working committees, finishing uh, those uh, committee reports to get them uh, compiled into the final NEASC documents for our NEAS visit next fall. So um, they went very, very well, very productive. Um, everybody was really involved with what they were doing. They had some time to work in groups, individually on curriculum, and they also had time to work on the evaluation process. So I think it uh, went very, very well. So the budget, what you have uh, in front of you is kind of a synopsis of, of additional requests uh, in the budget. There is um, curriculum monies in the budget, and wherever possible, we are rolling those monies forward to cover uh, some things, but what I want to highlight is uh, some areas of need that we need to look at uh, adding some money into our budget. And I'll start with curriculum materials. Uh, right now, the total on that is $103,330, and that covers uh, mainly uh, textbooks and materials. This is beyond what is already in the budget. Uh, one of the key things we need to seriously look at is a K-5 math series. Uh, the math series we have um, currently uh, needs to be updated. It was one of the original Common Core uh, curriculum that came out. Um, and actually, the company that seems to have uh, developed it no longer seems to exist. So that's kind of uh, kind of an issue. Uh, but there are right now better products out there. Uh, my hope is, uh, or my plan is, to start piloting math programs this spring. Uh, and look to make a decision with teacher and uh, as to what would be the best fit for Blackstone Milbo and to have that ready for the fall. So they will be um, piloting, what, about three, three different uh, programs? Two, two programs. We're looking at uh, Envision Math, which is an, which is a uh, Pearson product, and Go Math, which is a Houghton Mifflin product. Um, in the process of negotiating uh, that process, I had a meeting tomorrow morning with the Go Math person person earlier in the week um, to kind of get that off and going. Right now, the um, elementary principals are looking for volunteers in both buildings, looking for roughly, of course, what is it roughly, but two teachers in each grade level uh, at uh, AFM JFK, and uh, at least one teacher in, uh, in Millville. And then those three, and then there'll be a survey given uh, some focus groups so they can give us input into what their experience was on uh, piloting these programs so that we can make you know, a good informed decision on what would be the best for us. <laughs> Those are still traditional tech hard copy textbooks. Uh, they are. They are hard copies. Uh, they, all of the products out now have got a uh, online component to them, a technology component to them. Uh, that is something we need to look at, and I think we had this discussion earlier when we were talking about technology. Um, if we're looking at PARC and we're going to be assessing them on computers, they need to be using computers in the classroom. They need to be working in the same environment they're going to be assessed in. Um, and that's extremely important, and we're going to be looking for programs that, that do that. So help me understand um, the 103,000 here. So right now I'm looking at last year we budgeted budgeted about 270 grand um, for professional development, other textbooks, other instructional material, educational equipment. Um, that total there was 270. Is this 103 beyond that 270, or is there going to be some mixture in there around? Just helping us understand as well as the public. Yeah. The this 103 
is is um, over and above. Now, that's not to say that there's still some offsets that we will probably find as we go through uh, line by line. Uh, but it is um, really an uh, investment. The net, net of it all we will have in a couple of weeks. But you know, there will be some offsets. School budget, as, as everyone knows, interlocks in so many areas, and um, there's a lot of lines in it, and, um, and there's offsets from other sources of revenue as well, such as some of the revolving accounts, some of the grants, um, so that when we look at this, this is what these will cost, and, and the net of it all will probably be somewhere close to it, but it's hard to say how close until we look at all of the offsets. For instance, when there is uh, dollars in um, for high school professional development, if we get the Math and Science Initiative grant mm -hmm. to expand our AP offerings, some of that money would be used for that, so it's not going to be a total additional add-on. We already have some of that money available to us, so it wouldn't be an additional request. We would simply reallocate a portion of that for that and we're still waiting now for first to get grant approval, uh, hopefully soon, and then and that's pending the outcome of the state budget process, which got a curveball this past week with another three quarters of a billion out of whack on current FY15. So um, the Baker administration has a lot of work to do um, to simultaneously figure out how to balance the current year we're in as well as come up with a viable FY16 budget. And because he is a new governor, he has until March 4th to produce that. So that actually works a little bit to our advantage as the new guys, so that we have a couple extra weeks to really um, get into that, um, so that we come up with the accurate number as the true need over and above what we have been spending. Can I just ask a question? Um, I have two things. First, I just want to, you just mentioned the online um, availability. I would like to make sure whatever we do purchase that we have access to both. I think in, in these days and times that that should be an option to us and part of the contract that we do purchase, if you could make sure that that is. I can actually speak to the envision because we are, we um, just bought Franklin, so this is our first year coming in. Um, my kids take all their math tests online. Um, parents have access to it. Parents have access to the lessons, the videos. And you have a textbook. We have a textbook in the classroom, and the only thing the teacher has to run off are the homeworks, which are differentiated, to, um, enrichment, remedial, and also um, the regular practice. Um, and it a actually has been working very good. There was a few glitches, but I'd have to say for the most part, um, the use of technology, and we have Chromebooks as well. I saw that in the budget, but that's what they're taking the test online. And what they're actually doing is doing their work on paper. They're handing it in in case there's any glitches and we can still see the work. Um, and they're answering the problems online. Um, and the only thing that takes a lot of practice right now is actually when you go from paper to online, there's a lot less writing and a lot more multiple choice. So there's a little bit of a transition um, there. So we still have, you know, uh, five questions. It's called a task that they do. But the online program, and I can only speak for Envisions because we just started it, um, has, has a very big online um, component to it. Um, and like I said, usually when you differentiate, you know, there, there are parents who want the differentiating. They can go right on and they can see what we're doing and they can go to the next lesson. They can do it with their children. Their children can watch a three-minute video um, if they struggle. So, I mean, I give it a, I'm getting there. <laughs> um, it takes practice, but um, it's actually, it's much better right now than the everyday math. It's, it flows smoothly. Um, and uh, I can only speak for Envision that I think we're headed that way no matter what program you're looking yeah. at at this point. Um, yeah, and and both, both of these programs have parent components. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and actually, you'll, I mean, the, the idea of, you know, online textbooks or digital textbooks is really, the publishers have kind of caught on to that where they'll 
give you both, but charge you the same price. Um, so it is not particularly a, a saving as to talk about online textbooks. Right. Right. really offer that anymore. But, and, and just to add uh, to Mr. Reggio's point, the large majority of districts that are moving to a new math program uh, are choosing Envision. One reason may be that it is a Pearson product, and Pearson is also behind the park. The, uh, park. the park testing. So the thought being that they, if those don't align, nothing's going to. Align. <laughs> there is a, a lot of strong linkage um, already. And we are still waiting until uh, this fall before the board of ed officially approves if Park will replace MKIS. But all of the, I think, um, all of the uh, tea leaves point that they that they will, but that remains to be seen. And, you know, and, and just so you know, I mean, I didn't just pull these two products out of midair. You know, in my assistant superintendent curriculum group, uh, these were the two highest rated, raved about products in a lot of uh, districts that are having the seeing success. And again, you know, having the program is one thing, implementing the program is the more important thing. Uh, but these are the programs that people felt strongly about and felt that they were putting kids in a good position to be ready for them. And even moving into middle school as well is a good, yep. is a good transition there. Yeah, so. um, That's what I was going to ask, but how does this dovetail into what we're doing in middle school and then high school? Well, we're going to have to start someplace. We're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. I mean, you know, you have to have kids coming into middle school with, with good basic numeracy coming in so that you can build on it. Um, there is a sixth grade piece of that. I don't know whether we will eventually, you know, my, my plan is to jump in with both feet over our head. Um, right now, that's kind of what I figure we need to do. You, you, we will see a dip, being honest with you, but uh, we got to start moving up at some point. So we take a step back to make four steps forward, and that's the best way to In terms of the, uh, David, the PD for next year, you're going to take a hold of that and you're going to plan it out and map it out in terms of through these filters. Okay. And actually, actually, one of the things that we're, we're you know, I say meeting with and negotiating with, one of the things that they do is that they actually do some PD with the people who are piloting, which yeah, is, and which, and is and which, which is good because you have people that understand the programs and how they're supposed to be done. So they're implementing them or piloting, excuse me, not implementing, them, piloting them with, with some fidelity. Mm -hmm. So they really get a good idea as to what's going on. And then part of the negotiation and deciding the program is, okay, what PD are you offering? And usually it's at low cost or no cost. So, but envisions and, and go back to the two that have the biggest foothold right now in Massachusetts. And it's actually more about the, what we have in front of us. I know that we asked for different, so that I'm glad to see different. But I do, you mentioned the line by lines. Are we eventually going to see those? Absolutely. Okay. And just as soon as I can get them all completed. So seeing this, and, and I know that the question was already asked by Bill about, tell me where the 103... So is this the only increase we're going to see on those line items, or is there going? This is this is this is what? I'm sorry. Or will uh, the line items from this current year are they the rest of them staying? The goal, because what we're doing is is rather overreaching and, and complicated. What my my plan would be is to crosswalk the information so that the committee can readily see what was in FY. 15 current and what is going to be in that line for FY16 um, because that's the only way to have an idea and with so many lines in that budget that you can't possibly keep it straight. So the only other thing that was what we have, like, like, right? We gave, I just that's kind of quickly questions. did, you know, something. You know, but I think there is going to be that crosswalk where there's going to be additional dollars. Is it going to be this total? Right. Or maybe not. Usually when we're sitting here, yeah. um, we have every line, so I, I'm, I'm okay with it being different. I just want to see where this fell into. Yeah. And, and just to, to, to lay out the next month or so, um, we, we have special ed and student services coming in uh, as a workshop next week. That is a tremendously uh, volatile line in the budget and, um, and about as complicated as it gets to understand and analyze and project within the ballpark. And then after that, we have our elementary um, principals coming and then our school, high school, extracurricular. So that by the end of those workshops, we will have the understanding of what's in all of those lines, where they are being reduced, where we are asking for additional funding, um, so that everybody has the clear understanding of, of one set of numbers and the rationale for why they're there. And I think that that crosswalk going from one to the other is critical.
some say, well, the school budget should never increase more than 2.5% uh, because that's all the town's revenue gets to increase. Um, some people wanted to say the same. Um, but I have asked everybody on the leadership team and the staffs to come up with a true need, and then we will have to ultimately match the needs with the reality of the values. And as I mentioned the other night, uh, we will make it work, whatever the number is, whatever the number the committee brings forth and, and the town's vote, we will make it work. But I think it's important to know what each level gives us. And we do know that however we compare ourselves, we have a little bit of work to go to get to that district that we all want. And so we don't have to do it all at once, one big jump, but we have to have a plan. Um, we have to have a three-year plan as to where we see the revenues coming and then how we can spend against those. So this is only the first, the first piece of the homework to get all of the pieces in front of us to say, okay, here's what we're looking at the personnel. Here's what we need for curriculum. Uh, this is what our technology budget uh, needs to look like. And, um, then once, and then special ed, as those costs uh, fluctuate, once we have all of the pieces, then we can plug them in rather quickly uh, and cross plug them so that the committee has a thorough um, uh, understanding of what's in front. So is the hope is is the hope that after the presentations are done, after everybody meets with us, is that when we're going to get those line items on paper to see um, last year's and the projected for this year? Or yeah, I, I would hope that's because I'm I'm seeing that getting closer to closer to the end of February, right, and that's right. You don't get the release really on February 25th for public hearing on the 26th. Which is, a, and I'm, if right. you look at our series of, of people right. coming in, we're getting pretty close. Right. And, you know, my concern is um, I appreciate you looking for you know, getting into this math program and, and piloting. Um, what, what I was hoping to see is that, you know, I know we put a lot of money into the reading program. Um, and I know that, you know, now we're shifting, which is, which I think is great. Um, but I'd like to be able to see, okay, the money that we had last year in the reading program is now shifted to the math program, and I'm just, I, I, I have a tough time seeing that yep. um, just by what we have here. So I just want to, in my own mind, just get an idea of when we're going to get that projected uh, uh, budget so that we can actually analyze it and see, you know, just the movement of, you know, what we've seen in the past. Um, we're working on it as we go so that we don't have to wait until you know, the week of February vacation to get it all put together. Um, most of it will be in, in uh, final format between the February 5th and February 12th. So two weeks. And, and just to come back to the, the, the literature program is, is still there. Right. So, I, so that's not disappearing. The, the, these monies here are, are additional to what's in there. Right. Right. There, right. there might be some decrease because we don't need as much of something, right. but you know, these numbers might change, but the needs. This, you know. is, this is based on your analysis, looking at our, our district, looking at our programs and saying, we have a shortfall, right. we need to fill it with these right. programs, classes, curriculums, right. whatever. Right. Um, and, the, and, and just to come back to that, I mean, what, one of the things I did in the fall was I did uh, the materials and textbooks. Right. Which I think with, is great. Right. All this right. stuff on here is great. Um, and, and from there, prioritized. So there's more on that list. I'm sure. We need to, sure. need to address it. these these textbooks. Are any of them new courses that haven't been offered before? Yes. Good. Can I? Do you want me to? Do you, do you have more questions, or can I? Why don't, can I? Can I go all through the curriculum materials? And then I'll answer the questions. You're asking yep. questions I haven't gotten to yet. All right. So the next one, the next one down the uh, the literature closet. Um, these are actually books for the reading program. This is, you know, we have bought books, don't get me wrong, but we still need more, and especially at the K-1 level, okay? Uh, the program, the literacy program, the Teachers to Teachers program is absolutely fantastic. Um, it is the right basis for instruction. It's instruction-based, and you use a variety of materials to use, but you, we need to have the books for the kids to do the reading. Uh, and that's what those literary, literary closet, and 
that's $25,000 on top of what we already have in there. And you can kind of see how, how we have it. If, if we do that, we will be in pretty good shape. Um, the AP textbooks, and this goes back to the Mass Insight grant. And again, you know, this is how much they cost. We, some of the money from that grant might lower that number. But we're looking at, um, as part of our AP expansion, and these are new books and new courses, World History, AP Statistics, <coughs> AP Chemistry, AP Computer Science. Okay, that's on top of the AP. That's bait, that, that is doubling our AP offerings. Okay? That is, that is a very good thing. That's a very important thing to offer. Um, next step down, uh, the Grade 9 textbook. Very old. Definitely needs to be replaced. So they've been rebound. There's some that are falling apart. There's probably some that people have had as parents that their children are using. The problem is with this set of materials is that they have not been updated since the New English Standards. Okay, so that's why that is done. That's 13 from 30. That's just that's just ninth grade. Uh, Algebra 2 text, same thing. It's an old book. It is not necessarily aligned with the new. New Massachusetts, a.k.a. Common Core Standards for Algebra 2. Algebra 2 is your minimum requirement with, as to what we are now calling college and career ready in math. Successful completion of Algebra 2. So that's an important course. Okay, if you don't have Algebra 2, you go off to college and you don't pass Algebra 2, you're taking one of those, you know, make up remedial math classes. Okay, which is not what, not what we want our kids doing. We don't, we don't want them to spend the time on it or wasting the money on it. Uh, French 2, again, that book is also rather old and needs to be replaced. Forensics is, is a proposed new course. It's a very popular course. It brings uh, science in an investigatory and, uh, and inquiry sort of basis to it, which is the basis for the new science standards. Uh, the next one down, science probes. These are the probes that connect to the computers and do all the uh, fancy things. Those are parts of the AP curriculum. Okay? And again, we do get money through the grant four materials uh, inside, so that number might disappear if we get the grant. Okay. okay. So questions on? Any other questions on the curriculum? The plan, ultimately, is there's going to be some rotating texts every year. So this is going to want it done. Now, so I make sure that's clear. Right. This is going to be something that we have to do ongoing every right. year to kind of look at different subjects and who's up this year. Right. So it's really... This is small fry investment, honestly. We did it last year with the literacy, and, and we're going to continue to do it every single year. Just right. to make sure that that's clear to the public. But I think it's important that we update. Too, right, and absolutely. We're, we're way behind in, in way updating behind. what we have. So once we get that big update, the rotation will start, right. and it should be continuous. I remember uh, Mr. Dudak coming in uh, one of the years, and he put up on the screen, you know, the copyrights of all of the books. It was really, unfortunately, it was sad. And just, I know a lot of folks say, well, wait a minute, English is English and the language hasn't changed. That's true. However, what we teach, when we teach, and the sequence that we teach, and the emphasis on different parts of that is what has changed. And there is far more emphasis on uh, informational text, expository writing, those are the things that have to get into um, the textbook for the proper grade level and the proper sequence. And yes, it's money. And Mr. Gonzalez is, can't wait to tell us how some of that intersects with technology. And, and um, but you know, it's it's an investment in what we will have for the next foreseeable uh, generation. You know, the next 15, 20 years. So. Important shift. We don't want to do it all at once, but it has to be gradually over a couple or three years. And, and, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about it for tonight. Um, uh, it, it's, it's similar to the science labs at the high school. They haven't been touched in since it opened in 1970. We can't keep having that mentality. So I'm glad that this list is here. I'm glad it's going to be here ongoing because we have to invest. This, this is smart spending as far as I'm concerned. Right. Right. And, and, and none of those numbers are astronomical, right. really. I mean, you're not talking about $250 worth of textbooks. Uh, you know, the big, you know, the big one might be, you know, the math series. Um, you know, but I'm pretty sure, depending on which publisher we go with, we can, we can 
to buy now. I don't know, three years, which is what they see. But it's something that's going to bring our district forward and not keep us behind. Right. I think I, I just I appreciate the the work that went into the, the things that you had to go through to find out how old are these textbook. Um, you know, how old is our math our math program at the elementary school? So it's it's not easy, but I definitely think to move us forward, we need to get into that mindset. And a uh, similar thing is, you know, we all know this people at this table, but the textbook is not the curriculum. You know, I think some people could make that leap, unfortunately. Oh, a new, new math book must be a new curriculum. Well, no, we're buying the, we're selecting this math resource because the curriculum has changed. So we're looking for materials that align with the curriculum. Right? The textbook itself is not the curriculum. Right? I think some people kind of lose that distinction sometimes. Right? And actually, you know, the whole, the whole mapping process we're going through now fits in with, with the selection of materials. I think mean, looking, they go hand in hand. The first question was, you know, what do we have for materials? Do they align with the comments? The next, so now they've been mapping, so now they've, you know, this isn't fitting, that isn't fitting. And one last comment to wrap it up. You know, Dr. Thompson sits in an assistant superintendent Curry Hill Roundtable. I sit in the superintendent roundtable. We have statewide meetings. We're not trying to reinvent our own wheel. All of us that work in other districts in education understand, you know, what's at stake, and um, we're not doing anything that many, many other districts have not done or are in the process of doing to align curriculum, to increase rigor, to make sure that our students are ready um, for college or career when they graduate. And um, you know, I know that there's a lot of folks who think that. Well, it, it, I'm here to say that after looking at school budgets for a long time, it does take um, additional funds. I think what's important is to make sure that everybody understands that what we say is what we have, is what we spend, is what everybody should be comfortable that is transparent and accountable. And that's certainly what the school committee does. Um, and I hope that we can have some forums with the community um, after we, we have our final discussions. Be happy to meet folks on a Saturday maybe uh, or in the evening um, and take questions on budgeting and on school finance. There's an awful lot of things in play right now at the federal level. Uh, if there is reauthorization of our Elementary and Secondary Education Act, it will probably happen now with the Republican Congress, which will be a little bit of a shift, but Congress has not reauthorized that act at the federal level for the last eight years. Those, that piece of legislation is supposed to be reauthorized and updated every five to seven years. It has not been a uh, by choice, and um, it has been left to the current administration to govern through waivers and grants. And that's not what the students across our country deserve, and certainly we as educators need. So, and at the state level, there is another whole um, study going on that Mr. Chaplin mentioned with the Foundation Budget Review Commission because we know that the funding mechanism is broken. It, you, nothing is the same as it was in 1991 and 1992. Those aren't metrics were inputted into that foundation budget process, which ultimately spits out the Chapter 70 funding, which is the sole primary source for public education, and hopefully not FY16, but FY17. There may not be the additional $2.5 billion that's needed for that formula to represent what the cost of education is for our students in this time, 2015-16, but there is hope that the additional monies will be rebalanced so that towns like ours, who have been on the short end of those finances over the years, will have a little more equality as compared to the rest of the state. So there's an awful lot going on. Um, I get a little excited talking about it, as you can tell, um, and I would be more than happy to set up some, some uh, community forums um, so that folks can uh, come and talk and, and really so that we hear what's on everyone's mind. But th this budget will be um, explainable. It will be clear, and it will be forthcoming so that everybody knows what's in there. Nothing hidden. No surprises, and that's the only way to operate in, in the proper fiduciary role that we have. Okay, 
so under the category of professional development, we're looking at right now about forty-six thousand nine hundred fifty additional dollars uh, that would go towards training in the Edwin Teaching and Learning platform. Right now, we're just getting into the curriculum mapping piece. Uh, once we actually build the curriculum in there, using an understanding by design model, there is assessments, lesson plans, uh, all sorts of other things. You know, resources to use. So it is very. Um, complex and in-depth, uh, and that's to possibly bring uh, someone in for a web-based training two or three times throughout the year. I don't believe with our PD days we'll be able to get everybody in one fell swoop, um, but we do want to try to bring that piece to the next level. It's great to have materials if you don't have a well-designed curriculum and really the forethought into how to teach it and teach it effectively. It pretty much uh, doesn't get us very far. Uh, the Mass Insight, that's the AP grant. Uh, we have to have that in our budget. That's ten thousand dollars. We do get much, much more back from that, including training materials um, that will exceed the ten thousand. But we have to be able to put that up first. Um, math instruction training. Uh, asking about the uh, middle school. I'm looking at that money to look at um, training math teachers and also special ed teachers uh, in mathematics. Looking at how to be more effective in those areas. Um, that's why that is in there. That would probably happen during the year pulling teachers, so we have a cost of subs in there as well. Literacy, and again, that's our literacy program. That we, we, next year, we're adding in the writing piece that does uh, involve about a $10,000 increase from what we're doing now. That's what that is. Curriculum design, uh, we are going to do, once we have it all mapped out, uh, we need to go through unit by unit and design the actual curriculum units from the standards, not from materials, but looking at them, bringing a wide range of materials in to make sure our instruction is effective uh, and making sure we have money to make sure that training. Looking at a train the trainer sort of model, so you have experts in each building and it's self-perpetuating. Uh, it's not something where you have, you know, the guru coming in from the outside and they disappear and no one knows what they're doing. Uh, but if we have trained people in the building, they can go forward and train others. Uh, it will perpetuate and the ripples will keep going through. Um, early childhood accreditation, this is part of our full day kindergarten grant. We need to do this. Uh, that's the AYSC. The AYC. Any, yeah, sorry. Any, yeah, that one. <laughs> um, and so we need to uh, have money for that. And then teaching strategies goal is an assessment piece. It is lower because of our grant status um, than, it, than it could possibly be. Um, and we might actually get a little bit more money, but again, that's contingent on the state budget, how much money is put into those grants for next year. It might actually be free, but it is something that we need to do uh, to be in compliance with the early childhood uh, initiatives statewide. That's the PD part. Great. Technology, I'll start and then I'll let you talk. Uh, under technology, and we did talk uh, about the uh, Chromebook initiative one-to-one -one initiative in grades 9 to 10. Uh, through further research, we also um, realized that um, the math department has a global cart of Chromebooks. We already are going to go to a Google school. We're going to start um, this, as I mentioned last, uh, last meeting, we are going to start uh, turning it on this spring, get people trained and moving forward next fall. Uh, and the Chromebook is really a, a good vehicle to get into uh, the Google environment. So what we're thinking is that we would, you know, ninth and tenth graders would have Chromebooks, go to bring your own device possibly for juniors and seniors with Chromebooks uh, set for the math department, which already exists, but one for the English, one for the history, and one for the science department so they can share and move those around and give kids access to, to that environment. That, as we mentioned before, involves the mobile management software, which is a per-device piece in there. Um, and then the last thing under technology is Edwin Teaching and Learning. And that number is a guesstimate right now because um, right now it's free. The state has put money up for it as part of the Race to the Top grant. This is the last year of the Race to the Top grant. They're still deciding if they're going to partially fund that, not fund that, and the price of it depends on how many districts sign in between ourselves and districts in Ohio. So uh, the middle of the road or the upper third is around $7 a student, which is still considerably less than Atlas Rubicon and other things, plus it has pieces that Atlas Rubicon does not have. So estimating a cost of that at about uh, 
but there's only two closets, two network closets in Millville. Um, it is a smaller school, uh, but the, connect, yeah, the connection in the school is only at 100 megs. So if you were, for example, to have every student online at the same time and having the admin staff trying to do their work in X2 or email or web browsing, if you're having the computer labs trying to do some type of YouTube video streaming, that that school in itself would be at a crawl and you wouldn't be able to function. Now, we haven't had those types of situations, and it's very likely that everyone is online producing and trying to receive that content. But when I saw Millville, I'm like, that's the point. And the sadly point, what we say is our strength? This is But even, but even it was built 10 years old, right. there's still stuff here still, that we, yeah. you know. Yep. Right. Yeah. I, I just have a question. It's not your edition, because yeah. I'm reading Chromebook 70,000, but I'm reading Technology 46. Some of the money that's in the technology budget will be rolled into that. Yeah. And if we are, if we are, I mean, obviously you can't jump in and, and have Chromebooks from K through. Well, but well, you can just have to have the money to do it. An override on top of an override on top right. of an override. But yeah. if we're looking at curriculums that are that are online based, well, I, I, I would say online supported. I don't know if I would say online based. Because I don't I don't use it online. The only thing I do is take the test and it's a paper copy of our computer copy of the right. But you do have Chromebooks in your class. You have Chromebooks. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you look at Many elementary schools now. There's right. Problems. But we just got we just got them this year. Um, I mean, we we just just started. The infrastructure had to change based on just using the amount that we're using. And, 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 but I, what's the cart and what's the horse? We have to change the infrastructure. Yeah, before yeah, we yeah, yeah, before we add cat twenty five. That's like that's like a bell cow on a right. wheel. Right. And you can't. And you know. And, and we've talked in detail about about the backbone of the infrastructure of the high school and making sure that's ready for, for that. So, um, you know, I think once you, before you put the devices in, you need to have the backbone there. You can't do the backbone everywhere at once. Um, but, you know, the other thing, and I know I'm preaching, preaching to the choir, but, I mean, if you look just around here, every single person has got a, a, a device connected to the Wi-Fi in, in this building. And anyone who goes to a meeting right now expects there to be Wi-Fi there. If you go to McDonald's, you expect Wi-Fi to be there. Okay? Well, you know, we need to have that the norm. That's how our kids are going to be working and operating in the future. It's with portable devices in their possession. That is where the work is going to happen. That is where the assessments are going to happen. Um, back to the point with, you know, these, these math programs we're looking at. Once teachers get their hands on the online assessment piece, they don't let go of it because it's quick, it's easy, they get results fairly quickly, they get diagnostics right away, they know where to go and what to do with their kids to make sure they're making progress. It's the same with the work that they're producing with the devices. It, it increases and augments the learning. It's definitely teacher friendly to be a parent friendly. Yep. When I give a test online and a, and a parent will click on, you know, Johnny got a 90. These are his focus areas, and it lists it out. These are his. These are what he was his strengths, and it's amazing because the amount of work that it takes to do that as a, as a teacher just going through and saying, okay, question one was a number sense. Okay, it's just hours. Well, and also now it's just some state of three too parent engagement. Mm -hmm. Well, like, you see if parents, if parents were looking at it. Yeah, but, but I, I do think, I mean, that, that, the only thing that's going through my mind, well, many things going through my mind right now, but, you know, I think of the years and years and years, and, and none of us were here, but they kept patching the stinking roof, okay? And the equivalent of that is all getting some electrical tape and going to Millville and wrapping those, wrapping those yeah. Cat 25 wires that are all over the place. You know, we can't, we have, we have to stop doing that. We have to stop patching things and get some new things in there. Books, Millville, everywhere. And we got to plan it out. You know, and, and, you know we're, we're, we're real behind. 
Well, and I just, I, I mean, I, and, and the reason I was going there is, is I was going to say, I, I think we need even more than three carts. I mean, I think we need Chromebook carts that are available to teachers in a classroom who may need to, to access that. And, um, you know, putting, you know, if you start with 9, 10, and then you go 7, 8, and you go 5, 6, and, but your program curriculum, you're trying to start with K-5, I think if we're going to push the boundaries, we need to yeah. to push them even a little. And maybe there's some revenue streams out there that we have to explore yeah. and, yep. and go with. Yep. But you're right; we have to kind of. It has to be the norm. Yep. You know, you know. I'm, I even go with. Oh, we need to look at how we use our library time everywhere. You know, it's not just going and checking a book out anymore. It's going and getting on a Chromebook and looking at things and exploring things that way. But not only that, technology too. Yeah, absolutely. Because we have to get the kids. Yes. Not just this is a mouse. I don't think people know what a mouse is anymore. It's all finger moved, and I just think adjusting. Yeah, and, just right, and it is, and it is kind of funny because the population is coming up to the elementary schools now. They they did not grow up using mice. They have all right. used their fingers right. and touch screens. Right. Uh, and you, you, know, you you give a kid a screen without this, and they're very confused. And, you look at any baby carriage, they're all using touch screens. So that's going to be the future is as scary as I mean, I know we can't, you know, put, you know, those Chromebooks in the elementary, but can we look at something that's going to aid in there, that process when we get to the middle school and they're that much further ahead than where they are? Oh, well, my, 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 my sick, demented dream or my, my vision is that, you know, from 6 through 12, you have one-to-one Chromebooks. Five below, you've got classroom sets that they use in the classroom. Yeah. But again, or at least the lab. you gotta, you got to take, well, labs labs are dead. You're not going to be going to labs anymore. You're going to have the technology on demand when you need it. Um, but that's a multi-year process to get there. And there's several steps to it. One is actually having the devices. The other piece is having the infrastructure to support the devices. Because it isn't any good if everybody's sitting around looking at a screen, waiting for it, watching the wheel spin. Uh, that doesn't really help anybody else. And I was going to say, uh, Dave just mentioned it to our left. Is a, not to hit my left, but his left is a dinosaur of a computer lab. Uh, we use it only because we have nothing else. But we do need to get away from, as you were saying, Chairman, the patchwork. We need to be more progressive. There is going to be some sacrifice. And also, as Dave said earlier, maybe we have to take a couple steps back to go forward. But we do need to make that investment in our infrastructure, in the curriculum, in the, the type of vision that we have going forward in order to make a progression. You know, I come from Newport, where you know, people, if you think of Newport, it's uh, Ritzy Town, the mansions, the yachting, the, you know, the boats. But it is a very poor, demographically challenged city, and the children, uh, they don't have these devices that they have at home, for example. So we had to provide a lot of iPads, we had to provide Chromebooks, we had to provide, provide for them a lot of appliances for them to use. The great thing that I was able to do while I was there was make a case with the superintendent and with the school committee, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. That's a school committee that was very progressive and said, we're not going to skip. We're going to make hard decisions, but spend the money. And so now that district that I just left have brand new switches, APs. They have the Cadillac of the Cadillacs, which is Cisco. And so now you go into any building and you're always connected. You have readily accessible, you have readily access to all of your data, whether it's on your iPhone, your Google Droid phone, or on a laptop. Uh, there are no uh, no skimping around. They made the decisions and they're much better for you. You're not going to be a problem selling that you. Okay. Um, okay. Anything else? Just one real quick, and, and that is that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that technology has, has moved so quickly. Uh, Instagram has their 10th birthday. First Instagram in 10 years. They've already been around for 10 years. You know, uh, our seniors were in third grade when Facebook came on the scene. And 
zealots have only been around since 2010, and they're going to be obsolete with the bigger screens on, on some of the new devices. And um, you know, our smartphones have only been here since 2007, and yet it seems like we've had them forever. So nobody is planning to use less technology. And our students, when they get to higher ed and they start walking on campus, completely, as, as, as Osiris says, participate in all of our surveys, technology survey and the uh, regional agreement survey. We've got some really good information that will really propel where we're going forward. Um, too bad all the uh, seats were relatively empty. It was great to see Mrs. Warren and uh, Mrs. Newman's kids here. I we can do a lot more of that. Um, just with people at home, the next several meetings we'll be featuring one facet of our school each week in their budget. So we saw curriculum and technology today. The 29th, we're going to see student services, uh, February 5th, elementary, and February 12th, high school and middle school. So if you're particularly interested in one of those areas, please come to these meetings and participate. You can stop and ask questions, things like that. So don't sit at home with your questions. Please come to the meetings. Um, and then that's leading up to our public hearing, uh, February 26th. I think last year, a public <coughs> hearing, we had three people attend. Yeah, because that right. We had three people attend our public hearing last year. But yet, when we got to the town meetings, a lot of people said, well, I, I didn't know I wasn't informed. So please come to these preliminary meetings, or please come to our public hearing on February 26th. So. Uh, I would also like to thank the fourth grade class. I know that can't be easy for a 10-year-old to come and speak in front of uh, men with suits or not suits, but uh, ties and, and ladies and they did a wonderful job. I think they should be proud of the effort that they put forth. It's very professionally done. Um, congratulations to those teachers, but mostly to the children and their parents who probably worked very hard to um, make sure they presented themselves well. So, um, and um, I'm really happy I can drive around the elementary school now. And <laughs> even though the roof is not perfected. Um, the project has moved to a state where we've eliminated some of the chaos. When you do that, can you shut your Wi Fi off? You can tell it's raining. You can't connect to Wi Fi at the elementary school. So it's hard to get No, you can't. No. Uh huh. Did they turn it off? What? They, there's a public at Melville. Yeah. Uh -huh. They needed to choose somewhere else. They needed to, you know. Uh huh. I'm sorry, Judy. No, no problem. I also just want to say thank you to the fourth graders, the parents, and the teachers for coming tonight. Very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Echo the same thing. Yes, it was very nice to have the kids here, and I hope we see more of them. Um, if you ever need any, I usually have four at home that say, "Can I come with you?" <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just, I actually had a question about the updates we were got, were given about the um, where we stand to date with the budget. Um, our transportation contract is being renewed this year? Is that already in? In fact, it is. Okay. And our bus uh, contract is up June 30th. Okay. And uh, bid specs have to be written and that bid has to be put forth. Um, 
I just want to make sure that it's looked at very closely. I know we discussed that already, and um, I see the negative number here, so I'm just very concerned with that. I know at the beginning of the school year, the buses are very full. Um, we already missed that boat, but I, I think I think the number of the kids on the buses need to, needs to be looked at periodically through the year, so we can make sure we're spending that money where in the right place. Thank you. That's my question. Okay. Uh, I echo everybody who gets the danger of going last. Um, so uh, we got a lot of work to do over the next uh, many weeks, and uh, we hope people are here to participate or at least observe um, and, um, and go from there. So, um, we'll be here next week at a workshop. Uh, we'll not be live, but uh, it's open to the public. All right, time for a motion. Motion made by Jane, seconded by Wendy. All those in favor, someone say aye. 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 Good night. Are we at seven o'clock?